Live from DeWitt Theater on the campus of Hope College in Holland, Michigan, we bring you Inventing America. Tonight, we meet four delegates to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. John Adams from Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, Thomas Jefferson from Virginia, and John Dickinson from Pennsylvania. Now here is your moderator, Professor Mark Baer. Thank you, and welcome to the program. When the American colonies declared their independence from England, they not only defied the most powerful nation on earth, they set into motion the founding of the first modern republic. What happened in the summer of 1776 was nothing short of a miracle. But how long would it last? Let's go back to the Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia. Today we call it Independence Hall. It's where 56 delegates from 13 British colonies in North America met to discuss what to do about the taxes the British Parliament had imposed on the colonies. Taxes the colonies deemed unfair because they had no voice in the matter. And so they met in this room after Lord North, the British Prime Minister, showed he meant business. And how did he do that? By sending troops to confront American militia in Concord, Massachusetts. Across the Concord River in Lexington, a shot rang out on the morning of April 19, 1775. Nobody knew who fired it, but it started a revolution that changed the world. Each of our guests tonight played a critical role in that event. Our first guest is a lawyer by profession, but a farmer at heart, who sprang to prominence, perhaps notoriety is the better word, when he successfully defended British redcoats for their role in the Boston Massacre, one of the events that led to the revolution. Later, he went on to head the New Republic. Would you welcome, please, from the state of Massachusetts, the second president of the United States, Mr. John Adams. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on the program, Mr. President. Thank you. Sir, in the 21st century, we think of you as the most outspoken champion of American independence. You gave more speeches, took part in more debates than even Patrick Henry, yet earlier in your career, you defended redcoats charged with murder after the Boston Massacre. Why? Well, that's correct, but before I answer that, I want to clarify something. You said the American Revolution started when the first shot was fired at Lexington. It actually started earlier than that, and it didn't start with gunpowder. It started with molasses. Molasses? Yes, molasses. It started when Parliament passed the Molasses Act in 1733. The law forbade the colonies from importing sugar from outside the British Empire, and Lord knows <laughs> how we Americans love sugar. <laughs> when James Otis, a lawyer colleague of mine from Boston, fought the law in the British court and lost, it was then and there the child independence was born. I stand corrected. You were there then, I wasn't. Well, I was, sir, but a gleam in my father's eye in 1733 but I do know my history. I'm sure of that. <laughs> now, as to why I defended the Redcoats, the Boston Massacre, as you call it, I think of it as the Boston Riot because there was fault on both sides. It happened because the British had sent army troops to Boston to enforce the Townsend Acts, which Parliament had passed in 1767. Tell us about the Townsend Acts. Well, they were named for Charles Townsend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who came up with the idea, which turned out not to be a very good one. And partly their purpose was to force the colonies to comply with the Navigation Acts, which regulated trade. But mostly, it was a veiled, and this is what really got the Americans down to rub, it was a veiled attempt by Parliament to buy the allegiance 
of colonial governors by paying their salaries. And how did Parliament propose to do that? By taxing the colonies. So let me get this straight. Parliament was buying their loyalty with ransom money from the colonies. Precisely. <laughs> and not only did that infringe on the colonies' right to govern themselves, but it established the precedent that Parliament had the right to tax them. So why was Parliament taxing the colonies in the first place? To pay for the Seven Years' War. What time frame are you talking about? 1756 to 1763, seven years. After the British finished their campaign, their empire took in a quarter of the world's population, from India and the Pacific to North America and coastal Africa. Think of it, one fourth of the human race. And those victories cost a lot of money, not to mention the cost of policing all the new land they acquired, hence the taxes. Back to the Boston Massacre. The Boston Riot. <laughs> well, yes. They were a motley rabble of saucy boys, Irish teagues, Negroes, and mulattoes, outlandish jack tars. They taunted the British soldiers to fire at them, which they did. <laughs> Three civilians were killed on the spot, and two died later. Eight soldiers were tried for murder. I argued that they had the right to defend themselves because their lives were in danger. The jury acquitted all eight. What happened after that? Well, even though I had won the soldiers' acquittal, depictions of the riot found their way through the colonies, including an engraving by a Boston silversmith named Paul Revere. Well, after that, relations between England and the Massachusetts colony went into free fall. As they stepped up their military presence to enforce compliance with all the new laws and taxes, we stepped up our resistance. The tax on tea was the last straw. Sam Adams, a cousin of mine, rounded up a group of men had them dress up as Indians, and they raided three merchant ships in Boston Harbor, ships owned by the British East India Company. They dumped, what did he tell me, 342 chests of tea into the harbor. That's about 10,000 pounds worth. Who did you say rounded up the men? My cousin, Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams? They didn't throw beer in the harbor? Well, what are you talking about? Never mind. Tell us about your cousin. Oh, well, well Sam was a maltster, but never ran a brewery, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> well, in fact, he was a terrible businessman. He failed at every business venture he tried, but he was an effective polemist for the American cause, a true patriot, I must say. And I had the pleasure of serving with him in the Continental Congress. So he was the guy behind the Tea Party. The Tea Party? The Boston Tea Party. Good Lord, is that what you call it now? <laughs> How history puts labels on things. Speaking of tea, would you like some? It isn't taxed, is it? <laughs> not here, not anymore. Where did it come from? Trader Joe's. <laughs> While John Adams and his cousin Samuel and their fellow patriots were protesting British taxes and throwing tea into Boston Harbor, our next guest was in London pleading the American cause. We might think of him as the first American lobbyist. But he was much more than that. He was a printer, pamphleteer, scientist, inventor, statesman, advice giver. He was Leonardo da Vinci and Dear Abby wrapped into one. <laughs> Today, we think of him as the quintessential American. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Thank you.
Jackson. Yes. It's an honor to have you on the program, uh, sir. Uh, Would you like some tea? Uh, certainly. <laughs> uh, not too much, not too much. That's fine. Uh, yes, ah, thank you, thank you. Uh, by the way, who's Dear Abby? She writes, <laughs> she writes an advice column. Oh, well, I used to do that too, you know. In fact, I devoted an entire magazine to giving people advice. I uh, figured as I'd been around so long, I had a lot of advice to give. I'm sure it was very good advice. Yeah, would you like to hear some? Yes. A stitch in time saves nine. Thank you, sir. A penny saved is a penny earned. Very good, sir. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Thank you, sir. Fish and visitors stink in three days. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Hello, my dear. <laughs> uh, could we move on? Ah, well, as you wish. <laughs> Mr. Adams was just filling us in on what happened while you were away in London. Did you know about all those events like the Tea Party and the Boston Massacre? The Boston Riot. Ah, ah. well, yes, I did, of course. Uh, but it took anywhere from four to six weeks to receive the news, depending upon the wind. The wind? Yes, uh, over the Atlantic. Uh, that's how long it took ships to cross. Uh, I didn't learn of Lexington until a month after it had happened. Ah, uh, time delays. The hobgoblin of diplomacy. <laughs> It isn't that way any longer, I suppose. Not anymore, but I'm not sure that's an advantage. Ah, yes. Well, I spent long stretches of time in London because the voyages were long and difficult, particularly for a man of my years. And, well, sometimes the ships said didn't make it. How long was your last stay in London? Oh, ten years. From 1765, just in time to see the Stamp Act passed, until May of 1775. Prior to that, I was there for eight years. Did you have your family with you? Oh, no. Just William in the early years. My wife, Deborah, she refused to go. <laughs> she was even more terrified of the sea than I was. <laughs> so the last time you were there, you didn't see your wife for 10 years. Uh, that's, that's right. Well, technically, it was nine years, for she died in 74. I take it you didn't make it to her funeral. I, I, I still have a verse that I wrote to her. Uh, may I read it? Please, do. Not a word of her face, her shape, or her eyes, of flames or of darts shall you hear. Though beauty I admire, tis virtue I prize. That fades not in 70 years. Uh, she died of a stroke. I'm sorry, then, but I don't recall that you ever mentioned her. No. No, I didn't. You see, we were never formally married. She had married somebody else, and he had taken her dowry and fled to the Barbados to avoid the debtor's prison. It was never heard from again. Well, she couldn't legally marry me because of the bigamy laws. So we lived together as under common law, and she agreed to raise my illegitimate son. Oh, that would be William. Yes, yes, William. <laughs> what a fine boy he was. Oh, smart, industrious, affectionate. You know, he stood with me when I flew the kite for my electricity <laughs> experiments, yes. Sir, if I may, I would like to ask you about the Stamp Act that Parliament passed in 1765. Ah, well, it was a tax. It was imposed upon the colonies to pay for the British soldiers who remained after the French and Indian War. Uh, all printed materials, uh, uh, newspapers, uh, legal documents, uh, magazines, playing cards, you name it, all had to have a British stamp. And the stamp had to be paid for with British currency. Uh, I'm afraid I arrived too late to talk Parliament out of it. But that didn't stop you, Ben, from appointing a friend of yours. Oh. What was his name? 
John Hughes to collect the stamp tax in Pennsylvania. Don't you remember that a mob tried to tear your house down in protest? Yes, and I regret that I ever had anything to do with the stamp tax, though I spoke out in opposition to it later and got Parliament to repeal it. I had no idea how vehement the sentiment in America was against it. You were in England too long, Ben. You were out of touch. Mm. But it wasn't until Parliament passed the Coercive Acts in retaliation for what you call the Boston Tea Party that I realized the futility of my mission in London. So, in 1775, I came home. When I stepped off the ship in Philadelphia, I learned of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. I knew then that no single colony could stand alone. We must act as one, e pluribus unum. Then a month later, a young man arrived from Virginia to take his seat. He couldn't have been much over 30 at the time. This was Thomas Jefferson. He brought with him a reputation for literature and science and a happy talent for composition. Everyone was talking about a paper he had written called A Summary View of the Rights of British America. Uh, that was the first time I had heard of him. Why he arrived so late, I don't remember. Well, let's ask him. Our next guest was actually 32 when he took his seat in the Second Continental Congress. He too went on to bigger and better things. But when he arrived in Philadelphia, summer of 1775, nobody outside his colony knew much about him. Would you welcome, please, from the state of Virginia, the third president of the United States, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Wow. Oh, wow. Dr. Franklin, what a pleasure indeed. Oh, Adams. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. President. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> and you have a violin with you. Yes. It's the reason that I was late to the Continental Congress, or at least one of the reasons. How so? Well, this violin belonged to my cousin, John Randolph of Williamsburg. And when I set out to Philadelphia from Monticello, that's my home near Charlottesville in Virginia, well, I stopped off in Williamsburg to, to bid Cousin John farewell. I don't understand. Well, we, we for many years played the violin in Williamsburg. <laughs> yes, as I said, this was his violin, handmade in Cremona, Italy, <laughs> 16 and 60. See the date? Right in there. Oh, yes, I see. Yes. We made an agreement. If I were to die before Cousin John, then he would inherit my books. But if he were to die before me, I would inherit his violin. And that was all very official, signed and sealed in the general code in Williamsburg. Uh, George Wythe, my law teacher, and Mr. Patrick Henry, bore witness to it. Oh, yes. But then... The war broke out in Lexington, and Cousin John chose to side with England as he prepared to sail home, as he put it. He gave me his violin. You all right, Ben? Is it something I said? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm fine. It's simply that your story puts me in mind of William. Your son? Yes, my son William. I put everything I had into him. When so many people ridiculed my scientific experiments, it was William who stood with me when I lofted the kite into the clouds to prove that lightning was electricity. I knew he was proud of me at that moment. When he grew up, I, I was equally proud of him. When King George III 
appointed him royal governor of the colony of New Jersey. On my voyage home from London, I wrote him the longest letter I'd ever written. Ninety-seven pages. I poured my heart out. I told him how I tried to get Parliament to repeal the Tea Act, how, how all my overtures for reconciliation had failed, and I told him he should resign his appointment. When I got off the ship, I learned the news from Lexington. Did he ever respond to your letter? His response was to mount an assault against the Patriots. I was never so hurt in my life as to be deserted in my old age by my only son. Not only to be deserted, but to have him take up arms against me in a cause wherein my, my, my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor were at stake. I am very sorry, sir. I'm sorry too, Ben. But you know, defections like Dr. Franklin's son and Mr. Jefferson's cousin were not at all unusual. Our troubles with England split a lot of families apart. You were either a loyalist or a patriot, or you didn't give a damn. My cousin John's elder brother was Peyton Randolph, whose seat I inherited in the Continental Congress. It was at St. John's Church in Richmond where the Virginia House of Burgesses met to decide whether they would pursue further our conflict with England. <laughs> oh, all of the talk was over Patrick Henry's speech, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> where he ever came up with that torrent of language, I have never known. Oh, because I never knew him to read a book through in his entire life. <laughs> All tongue, no head. <laughs> but no matter. No, it was the last day of that convention when they elected me to be the alternate delegate for Peyton Randolph. It didn't seem to be noticed by anyone. So that's how you came into the Continental Congress? Yes. I was an afterthought. You might say I came in through the back door. <laughs> well, Tom, you were only how old when you were elected? 31. Oh. oh, but let there be no misunderstanding. It was not how I arrived, but whether I would arrive at all. I, I had no choice. I was needed much more back home in Virginia. My wife was ill as well, our younger daughter. The separation must have been difficult. Oh. Oh, indeed, I, I yearned to hear word of my wife back home. And as for our daughter, little Jane, she died at 18 months. Yet, you did come, sir, and what a difference it made. It's impossible to imagine our country today without the Declaration of Independence. May I ask you how it came into being? And would you be willing to play the violin for us a bit later? Oh, yes, I might be persuaded. <laughs> but in answer to your question, uh, when the Virginia House of Burgesses met in convention then in, in Williamsburg, <laughs> I was able to find time for myself. So I, I buried myself in my study at Monticello. I reflected upon uh, the relations of the colonies with Great Britain and how indeed we were imposed upon by all sorts of injustices. And thereby I wrote down my thoughts and draft instructions for the Virginia Convention that the delegates might pursue them in the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. What's the gist of this paper? I argued that the Americans had submitted voluntarily to fall under the authority of, of Parliament. However, we could, if we choose, Release ourselves from that authority. What is freely given may be freely taken away. As the Bible says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Ah, yes, but in this case, 
it was the Americans. I question whether Parliament had any right to impose the Stamp Act and the Townsend duties. I question whether Parliament had any right to close down the port of Boston. Sir, may I prevail upon you to read a few passages, perhaps beginning here? Oh, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Scarcely have our minds been able to emerge from the astonishment into which one stroke of parliamentary thunder has involved us before another more heavy and more alarming is fallen upon us. Single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day, but a series of oppressions begun at a distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers to plainly prove a deliberate and systematical plan of reducing us into slavery. Hmm. May I continue? Please, now. Ah. <clears throat> Can His Majesty thus put down all law under his feet? Can he erect a power superior to that which erected himself? He has done it indeed by force, but let him remember that force cannot give right. A free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as the gift of their chief magistrate. Kings are the servants, not the proprietors of the people. Let not the name of George III be a blot on the page of history. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. And you wrote this in? In 17 and 74, uh, before the Virginia Convention met in Williamsburg. And the purpose of that convention was to elect delegates to the General Congress in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That is correct. And what happened to the paper at the convention in Williamsburg? <laughs> it died on the table. Peyton Randolph believed that a tamer sentiments were preferred. But the printed version found its way to Philadelphia. And to London where it procured from Mr. Jefferson the honor of being listed in a bill of attainder. <laughs> a bill of attainder. Mm. Yes, a, a criminal indictment issued by Parliament. I, I tried to stop that too, but I couldn't. <laughs> uh, it made Mr. Jefferson a fugitive from justice. And if he had been caught? Oh, well, he would have been hanged for treason. But that was true for all of us, ma'am. Yes, which is why I said we must all hang together or most assuredly we will all hang separately. Huh? <laughs> Remember? <laughs> well put, Dr. Franklin. So let's talk about the Second Continental Congress. Mr. Jefferson, you said you arrived late. Yes, two months after Lexington. Uh, and George Washington, another Virginia delegate, had just vacated his seat. Why so? Oh, to command the Continental Army. I'm the one to blame for that. I was the one who nominated him. It was to keep John Hancock from becoming the commander in chief. You see, it was Hancock, not Washington, who wanted the job and expected it. <laughs> I can see him now sitting in the president's chair. He had taken Mr. Randolph's place. Hancock listened with visible pleasure while I was making my nominating speech. And when I came around to uh, describing Washington as my choice, <laughs> I never saw a more rapid change of countenance. His <laughs> <laughs> jaw dropped a mile. <laughs> <laughs> So why nominate Washington rather than Hancock? Well, partly to keep his vanity in check. <clears throat> I've never known anyone to equal him on that score. You should talk, John. <laughs> oh, I admit to my having my share of vanity then, but Hancock had the most obstinate case I ever saw. Did you ever notice how he signed his name? <laughs> John. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
The main reason I nominated Washington was that he was a southerner. We Bostonians, all of us from Massachusetts, in fact, were a highly suspect lot. Nobody from the middle colonies trusted us except Dr. Franklin. What about Mr. Dickinson? John Dickinson? Surely you jest. But wasn't it Mr. Dickinson who called attention to the folly of the Townsend duties in his letters from a Pennsylvania farmer? Oh, but then what did he do? After Lexington, he drew up an olive branch petition in an attempt to appease the king. Imagine that. It embarrassed every exertion we made in the Congress. Ha! It was an act of imbecility. The work of a peddling genius. Now, now, John, calm down. <laughs> we can't all have the same opinion on the same subject at the same time. Besides, I've always found Mr. Dickinson to be a man of sound character. Hmm. I'm sure he had his reasons. Well, let's find out what his reasons were. What are you talking about? <laughs> let's have Mr. Dickinson speak for himself. Good Lord! You didn't invite him to sit at this table, did you? Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest is known as the penman of the revolution. Welcome the farmer from Pennsylvania, Mr. John Dickinson. Hello, John. <laughs> oh, no, pay no attention. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I wonder if you could tell us about your letters from a Pennsylvania farmer, which put you at the forefront of the conflict with England at the beginning, and then later why you pulled back. Hmm. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. After Parliament passed the Townsend Acts in 1767, I wrote a series of letters for one of Dr. Franklin's newspapers, the Pennsylvania Gazette, in which I argued that the taxes that Parliament imposed on the colonies was unconstitutional and contrary to natural law. I argued that the right to levy taxes was the sole prerogative of the colonial assemblies, but I supported Parliament's right to enact regulatory duties on trade within the British Empire. You see, Mr. Dickinson's letters expressed the American sentiments of the time, which is why I instructed that they be published in the Gazette. After I came into the Continental Congress, by then, relations with a mother country had greatly worsened. I co-authored with Mr. Jefferson a declaration of the causes of taking up arms, in which I affirmed our resolve to die free men rather than to live as slaves. That also echoed the sentiment of the time. But then, Mr. Dickinson, you undid all that with your olive branch petition. Your timing couldn't have been worse. Did you think the ministry and parliament would relent after hearing of the battle at Lexington? <laughs> what did you expect from them other than deceit and hostility and fire and sword? All your position did was to cause the king to declare the colonies in rebellion. What on earth possessed you to write it? I don't know if you or anyone else here, except for Dr. Franklin perhaps, knows what it means to be a Quaker. We are opposed to war as much as we are to slavery. But for me, it was more than that. You, sir, had a cousin to deal with. And you, sir, ha had your son. I, I can't imagine how painful the falling out with him must have been. But, but gentlemen, I didn't have just one person in my family to deal with, but the entire Quaker establishment in Philadelphia. They never ceased from intimidating my mother and my dear wife, who in turn begged me to hold back. Do you know what my mother said to me? She said, Johnny, if you continue on the course you're on, you'll be hanged. Your estate will be confiscated. You'll leave your excellent wife a widow and your charming children orphans and beggars. Wouldn't that give you pause? If I'd had such a wife and such a mother, I believe I would have shot myself. <laughs> Gentlemen, I beg your leave. 
That was unfortunate. I suppose I should apologize to him. Well, that leaves just the three of us. Yes. Sir, Mr. Dickinson said that the taxes Parliament imposed on the colonies were contrary to natural law. I'm curious about that point since you made similar references in your writings. The attack upon Lexington was not only an attack upon Lexington, it was not an attack upon the colonies, it was an attack upon all mankind. Indeed, that is the gist of what I tried to incorporate in our Declaration of American Independence. I was hoping we would get around to that. Today, the Declaration of Independence is the thing for which you are most remembered. Did anyone know in 1776 that you had authored it? Not outside of the Continental Congress. How were you picked to write it then? Well, Mr. Adams could answer that for us, but as he is not here, uh, I'm afraid that... Excuse me, may I? Please. Yes. Well, there were five of us named to a committee to draft the document. Uh, there was... Um, uh, oh, help me, Mr. Jefferson. My memory is... Uh, and Mr. Sherman from Connecticut. Mr. 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 Livingston from New York. That's right, yes. Uh, you. Yes, me. Mr. Adams. Yes. And... And, uh... Um, me. Oh, oh, yes, you. Yes, there were five. And there yes. were five of us. <laughs> two from New England, two from the Middle Colonies, and one from the South. Yes, I recall now. Uh, what I remember is that I had an attack of the gout. Mm -hmm. And that is what ruled you out. Otherwise, you would have written it. What about Sherman and Livingston? Oh, they were only on the committee for geographical reasons, not literary ones. So the choice came down to you and Mr. Adams. And that is correct. Well, I apologized, but Mr. Dickinson said he needed a few minutes to regain his composure. I expect he'll be back. Thank you, sir. We were just talking about how the committee in charge of the Declaration of Independence was appointed and how the choice of who should write it came down to you and Mr. Jefferson. Oh, yes. Uh, as I said, Mr. Jefferson brought to the Congress a reputation for literature and a happy talent for composition. Writings of his were handed about, remarkable for their felicity of expression. Though a silent member of Congress, the whole time I sat with him, I never heard him utter three sentences together, he was so prompt and explicit and decisive in committees and in conversations that he seized upon my heart. The committee you spoke of met and then appointed Mr. Jefferson and me to make the draft. Mr. Jefferson proposed to me that I write it, but I refused. Why will you not, he asked. Reasons enough, I said. What can be your reasons? And I replied, reason first, you are a Virginian, and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Well, you said it, John, not I. <laughs> you are very much otherwise, I said. Reason third, you can write ten times better than I can. And then Mr. Jefferson said, well, I'll let Mr. Jefferson finish the story. I said that if you are so decided then, I will do as best as I can. Meanwhile, uh, there was a motion on the floor calling for independence. Yes, I, I, I have it. I have it just here in the Pennsylvania Gazette. Um, Friday, June 7th, resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance from the British crown and that all connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. <laughs> Let's <laughs> not...
Let's not forget the role Thomas Paine played in getting us to this point. The author of Common Sense. Correct. It had just come out. No resolution of the Congress, no paper written by Mr. Jefferson or anybody else, did more to turn the tide of public opinion in favor of independence than Mr. Paine's little pamphlet. His message spread to the colonies like wildfire. I remember it now, verbatim. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Everything that is right or reasonable pleads for separation. The blood of the slain, the weeping voice of nature cries, tis time to part. Those are powerful words. Especially from someone who made his living as a corset maker. <laughs> well, it was a people's revolution. Mr. Dickens, welcome back. Yes, John, welcome back. We were just discussing Mr. Payne's pamphlet, Common Sense, and how it turned public opinion in favor of independence. Yes, I read it. If I may say, sir, Common Sense was the culmination of our propaganda war against the British, which started nine years before with your letters from a Pennsylvania farmer. For that, we are indebted to you. Well. Thank you for that. Gentlemen, if we could go back to discussing the Declaration of Independence. Well, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia had introduced his resolution for independence on, what day did you say, Ben? The 7th of June. Ah, yes, I remember now. It was late on a Friday afternoon, and the debate was postponed to Saturday. Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. On the right side of the room were the radicals. Uh, you, your cousin Sam, Mr. Richard Henry Lee. On the left were the conservatives and Mr. Dickinson, those of the middle colonies, and Mr. Rutledge from South Carolina. Oh, <laughs> the debate dragged on through the whole weekend. <laughs> I argued that the colonies weren't ripe for the break, that it was better to wait than to force the issue and risk secession. I argued that independence was already a fact, that a declaration would merely acknowledge it. Uh, finally, the issue came down to one of timing. On Monday, the two sides reached a compromise. Delay the vote for three weeks. That way, those of the middle colonies could correspond with their assemblies for instructions. That's right, and that's when I went to work upon our Declaration of American Independence. For two weeks, I buried myself in those rented chambers there on the corner of 7th and Market Street in Philadelphia, and there I wrote out the first draft of our Declaration of American Independence. Here, I have it. <laughs> Could we go back to the moment that you read the first draft to Mr. Adams and Dr. Franklin? It was in late June, 1776. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. <laughs> I challenge you to diagram that sentence. <laughs> May I continue? I'm sorry. Please do. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Strike sacred and undeniable. No, no, it's too dogmatic. Besides, it's obvious. Is that the word you want? Hmm? Obvious? We hold these truths to be obvious. <laughs> Are you familiar with Euclid's Elements? 
I read them in school, but... Uh, things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. <laughs> uh, Euclid's first axiom. All of mathematics, he said, is based upon axioms, truths which are self-evident. It... May I see that? All men are created equal. Is that not also self-evident? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Yes, yes, let that be our axiom. Self-evident? Self-evident. <laughs> Self-evident it is, then. Now, go back to the page where you accuse the king of abetting the slave trade. How did you phrase that? Ah. The Christian king of Great Britain has waged cruel war against human nature in the persons of a distant people who have never offended him, capturing and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. Yes, that's it. You blame the slave trade on the king, uh, when in fact that uh, enterprise began back in the 1500s, long before his time. It was engaged in by, by other nations, such as Spain and Portugal and the Netherlands, who are equally complicit. Moreover, you say nothing of slavery itself. If the slave trade is outlawed, would not the slaves already on our shores be a more, um, how shall I say, uh, valuable commodity? That is not my purpose, Dr. Franklin. Slavery is an offense to human nature. I tremble that God's justice will not sleep forever. But the purpose is independence, not emancipation. I concede the point. It is good, sir. Your paper is very good. I admire the high tone and flights of oratory. But my concern is not unlike Dr. Franklin's. In your list of charges, you call the king a tyrant. The expression is too personal, too scolding for so grave and solemn a document. But we shall see how it fares on the floor. Aye. And that is more or less how it happened. Thank you for taking us back to that moment. After I read it to Dr. Franklin and Mr. Adams, well, I made a few corrections, and then I submitted it to the committee. We were in haste because Mr. Lee's resolution was coming up for a vote. And when did that happen? July 2nd. And it passed unanimously. Mr. Dickinson wasn't there to vote against it. So that was the day that Congress declared independence. That's right. That was our first Independence Day, July 2nd, 1776. Mr. Adams told me of a letter that he wrote to his wife, Abigail, after Mr. Lee's resolution passed. Do you have to bring that up, Ben? What was it you said in that letter, John? Hmm? I told Mrs. Adams that the second day of July, 1776, would be the most memorable epoch in the history of America, that it ought to be celebrated with pomp and parade, with shows, games, Sports, guns, bells, bonfires and illuminations from one end of the continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. <laughs> July the 2nd. <laughs> well, sir, you were only two days off. Well. Mr. Lee's resolution notwithstanding, the fact that you celebrate Independence Day on July 4th, not July 2nd, 
is testimony to the power of the written word. So what happened after Mr. Lee's resolution passed? Well, we took up debate on Mr. Jefferson's draft, and let me tell you, there is nothing worse than turning a room full of lawyers loose on a piece of paper. <laughs> they fell on it like a pack of wolves. For three days, they tore away at it, ripping out offensive words and phrases as if they were cancerous tissue. My colleague, Dr. Franklin, slept through most of it. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, now, now, John. I, I, I heard every word you spoke in defense of Mr. Jefferson's paper. It's simply that my ears work better when my eyes are closed. Well, the slashing went on for three days. And by the evening of the fourth, it was a Thursday, and oh, Lord, was it hot. We had closed the windows to keep the deliberations private. Finally, John Hancock ordered a final reading of Jefferson's paper and called for the vote. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how it went? Oh, yes. Uh, Twelve colonies voted yay. New York abstained because they hadn't received instructions from their assembly. Again, Mr. Dickinson stayed home. Mm. So when did New York vote? July the 15th. That's when it became unanimous. So I take it the declaration wasn't signed on the 4th of July. That's right. We passed it on the 4th. We didn't sign it till later. The first public reading was on July 8th in the yard outside of the Pennsylvania State House. Oh, my, what a scene that was. Thousands of citizens embracing and cheering. <laughs> Uh, and did any of them know that Mr. Jefferson had written it? Uh, no, 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 no one outside of the Congress. I think he preferred it that way because he was upset over what Congress had done to it. Is that true, Mr. Jefferson? Yes, they mangled it. <laughs> pride goeth before the fall, Tom, including pride of authorship, but I did my best to defend your work. Yes, you did, and I will ever be grateful for that. No, I was distressed for other reasons. What were they? My wife. As I mentioned earlier, our dear little daughter Jane had passed away. And therefore I left my wife in a great distress when I went up to Philadelphia. The only thing that kept me in Philadelphia was a sense of duty. Oh, but... I yearned for my replacement so that I could simply go home. And you, sir, had some anxiety of your own. Is it true that you refused to sign the Declaration of Independence? Yes, that is true. <clears throat> but I want Mr. Adams to know that since I could not in good conscience remain a delegate to Congress, I resigned from that distinguished body and became a Brigadier General in the Pennsylvania militia. I want you to know that I too joined in the fight for independence. So, my friend, you redeemed yourself. On that note, gentlemen, perhaps we should wrap this up. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, would you be kind enough to give us a tune? <laughs> Something short. Here. I sent away to London for this before the boycott, uh, a composition by um, George Friedrich Handel, uh, entitled La Réjouissance. <laughs> well, my friends, that's what happened in 1776, the year of the founding of the new United States of America. Please join me in thanking our guests, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Mr. Thomas Jefferson, Mr. John Adams, and Mr. John Dickinson. And thank you, friends, for joining us tonight. Have a happy 4th of July. Or, or is it the 2nd of July? Whatever. Have a good night. God bless.
To order a copy of Inventing America, Making a Nation, call 1-800-442-2771 or order online at gvsu.edu slash wgvustore.